Section 928, International Studies of Domestic Abuse. The academic literature on domestic violence is huge. It would not be appropriate to attempt a review here. However, there are a couple of references worth mentioning briefly. The first is the compendium of references examining assaults by women on their spouses or male partners, an annotated bibliography, by Martin Fiebert, reference 56. Quote, This bibliography examines 286 scholarly investigations, 221 empirical studies, and 65 reviews and or analyses, which demonstrate that women are as physically aggressive or more aggressive than men in their relationships with their spouses or male partners. The aggregate sample size in the reviewed studies exceeds 31,600. Earlier versions of this review have appeared as peer-reviewed publications, each succeeding paper accumulating further evidence. The quote I just gave you was from the 2012 version. Earlier versions can be found in 1997, 2004 and 2010. And in the reference is at the end of the, uh, the, in the end notes, I'll actually include the more recent Martin Fieber reference. The other international study which is particularly worth noting is the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge or PASC project reference 57. This was published in May 2013 in the journal Partner Abuse and is the most comprehensive review of domestic violence research literature ever carried out. This unparalleled three-year research project was conducted by 47 scholars at 20 universities and research centres. John Hamill, the director of PASC, said, The purpose of this project is to bring together in a rigorously evidence-based, transparent and methodologically sound manner existing knowledge about partner abuse with reliable up-to-date research that can easily be accessed by anyone. PASC is grounded in the premise that everyone is entitled to their opinion but not to their own facts, that these facts should be available to everyone and that domestic violence intervention and policy ought to be based upon these facts rather than upon ideology and special interests. The headline finding of the PASC review was that, quote, Men and women perpetrate physical and non-physical forms of abuse at comparable rates. Most domestic violence is mutual. Women are as controlling as men. Domestic violence by men and women is correlated with essentially the same risk factors and male and female perpetrators are motivated for similar reasons. A key numerical result from the PASC project was this. Among large population samples, 57.9% of interpartner violence reported was bidirectional, 42% unidirectional, 13.8% of the unidirectional violence was male to female, whereas 28.3% was female to male. In other words, about twice as many Incidents, incidents were female to male than the reverse. In contrast to the CSEW, which indicates that about one in three victims of partner abuse is male, the International PASC project implies that men experience a rather greater amount of victimisation than women. Their conclusion is that, as regards unidirectional partner violence, men are victims twice as frequently as women. It's claimed that women may be impacted more by domestic violence. Certainly it's likely that a given degree of physical force may cause greater injury to a woman than to a man, though this will depend upon the individuals. But this should not, in my opinion, confuse the issue of equal culpability. In practice, however, it probably does. Moreover, the PASC project observes, quote, 
There was a relative dearth of research examining the consequences of physical and psychological victimization in men, and the studies that have been conducted have focused almost exclusively on sex differences in injury rates. Relatedly, there is limited research on the psychological consequences of abuse on male victims, and the research that does exist has yielded mixed findings. Some studies find comparable effects of psychological abuse across gender, while others do not. Reference 58. In this context, recall from section 922 that the 2017-18 CSEW reported that more men than women who reported partner abuse in the UK in that year tried to kill themselves as a result of the abuse. So, the psychological impact of partner abuse on men is no less than that upon women. Section 929, Dads as Victims of Domestic Violence Fathers who are subject to partner abuse whilst living with their children face a particular problem. In the context of partner abuse against women victims, it has long been unacceptable to ask, foolishly, why does she not just leave? Yet the same unthinking question is still acceptable in the context of abused men. Why does he not just leave her? The complete answer is complex, but where children are present, the answer may be very simple. He sticks around for fear that the children will become the target of abuse in his absence. Men face an acute difficulty in this respect, because not only are refuges for men a rarity, but there are almost none to which a father may flee with his children. The Welsh Dad Survey, carried out by the charity FNF Both Parents Matter Cymru in 2017, reference 59, provided many comments which alluded to domestic violence against the respondents themselves or their children by their partner. In 2018, the same charity conducted a survey specifically for male victims of domestic abuse, though not specific to Wales. Some results were as follows. 681 men who responded identified as a victim or survivor of domestic violence and abuse as set out in the UK government definition. 92.6% of the respondents were from the UK. 15% of respondents did not identify as white British. 12.2% identified as black, Asian or mixed race. 13.7% declared a disability. 93.75% of victims were no longer living with their abuser. 95% of reported abusers were identified as female and only 3% as male. The survey obtained respondents' answers to the questions relating to a. the nature and prevalence of any physical abuse, b. the nature and prevalence of any non-physical abuse, c. for those who did not wish to th- who did not seek help as a victim of domestic abuse, what prevented them from doing so, and d. what sort of help would have made things better. A few salient findings were as follows. Just over half of male victims did not appreciate at the time that what they were experiencing was abuse. They didn't know where to turn for help and they did not expect to be believed. Just under 70% of respondents had faced prejudice or stereotyping as a victim of abuse because they were a man, e.g. police telling them to man up, social workers assuming they must really be the perpetrator, domestic violence support services asking them questions determining, to determine whether their partner was the real victim and so on. And when asked how important it was that services for male victims should be grounded in the experience of men and separated from services primarily designed for women, 82% of respondents thought this important or essential. Section 9 to 10, Domestic Abuse Services, The Sexes Compared. 
Data from Women's Aid Federation of England, reported in reference 60, indicated that there were 3,798 beds in women's refuges in England in 2017, up from 3,467 in 2010. Pro rata, this suggests nearly 4,500 bed places for women's refu- in, in women's refuges in the UK as a whole. In contrast, Mankind Initiative, reference 29, identifies only 105 refuge beds potentially available for male victims, of which only 31 are dedicated for male victims. There are no refuge or safe houses at all in London for male victims. Moreover, there is no provision for men to flee domestic violence with their children. In Wales, in year 2015-16, a total of 1,518 women were referred to and accommodated at a refuge. The corresponding figure for male victims was 41. The extent of support provided to victims of domestic abuse in Gwent in 2015-16 has been provided in Table 73 of Appendix 3 to the Gwent Regional Violence Against Women Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence Strategy 2017-2022. Support for victims of domestic abuse were provided to 2,478 women and 69 men. In North Wales, the corresponding figures were 2,401 women and 32 men. As quoted by FNF, both Parents Matter Cymru, uh, reference 61, and referenced by the National Assembly for Wales Petitions Committee, reference 62. Clearly, there is a massive disproportion in service provision for male and female victims. The provision of refuge space for male victims is around 0.7% to 2.8% of that for female victims. This is glaringly inconsistent with the relative prevalence of abuse suffered by men, 34% based on the CSEW, 24% of police reports in the UK, 17% of victims in prosecutions in the UK, and do remember more than half, according to PASC. Whilst there may not be a need for equal refuge space for men, there is an obvious and huge shortfall in service provision to men at present. The almost complete lack of facilities for fathers to flee with, flee with their children can be particularly problematic for abused men. Section 9 to 11, Perpetrator Programmes. There are treatment programmes to correct the behaviour of perpetrators of partner abuse. In the UK, as in most countries, these programmes, perhaps better called re-education programmes in the main, are based on the Duluth model. The Duluth model originated from cases in Duluth, Minnesota, studied by Ellen Pence and Michael Paymar in 1993, reference 63. It is based on the patriarchal power and control theory of domestic violence, which admits no motive other than an assumed male desire for dominance over women. Consequently, it does not and cannot recognise that men can be victims or that women can be perpetrators. The mindset of the model is adequately portrayed by its now infamous power and control wheel, reproduced as figure 915. It recognises only female victims and male perpetrators. In the UK, perpetrator programmes are accredited through the charity Respect, whose accreditation standard is explicitly applicable only to male perpetrators abusing female victims, reference 64. Moreover, the accreditation effectively ensures that only programmes conforming broadly, if not necessarily in name, to the Duluth male power and control theory can be accredited. For this reason, perpetrator programmes which are based on any other understanding or methodology will find it harder to get funding or to be accepted by authorities such as the courts or social services due to lack of 
accreditation. Unsurprisingly, given that male power and control is a false view of domestic violence in the great majority of cases, Duluth programmes have a woeful record of success, despite the man's further contact with his children often being dependent on completing such a programme. A thorough review of studies appraising the efficacy of Duluth-type programmes is beyond the scope of this book, but it's valuable to make some passing observations. Consider firstly the study by Dutton and Corvo, reference 65, from which the following are quotes. The Duluth model's negligible success in reducing or eliminating violence among perpetrators in tandem with the iron grip of prohibition of other approaches is perhaps its most damaging feature. Dutton 2003 argued that Duluth models had two major flaws that were contraindicative of effective treatment. They attempted to shame clients and, in taking a strong adversarial stance to clients, based on a view of male sex role conditioning as a major issue in domestic violence, failed to establish a therapeutic bond with their clientele. The single most predictive factor for successful therapeutic outcome, even those labelled interventions, is the therapeutic bond. However, it becomes extremely difficult to form a positive relationship when the therapist is required to assume that strategic intentional domination is the sole motivation for all clients and to presumptively disbelieve any claims of mutuality raised by clients. More recently, the report Transforming Rehabilitation, a summary of evidence on reducing reoffending, reference 66, contains this statement. The most recent systematic review of US evidence indicates that the Duluth model appears to have no effect on recidivism. However, this review also identified substantial reductions in domestic violence reoffending by offenders who had attended other interventions. That was an MOJ reference, by the way. The US referencing question that they cite is what works to reduce recidivism by domestic violence offenders, reference 67. A more recent review of the effectiveness of perpetrator programmes has reconfirmed the woeful record of Duluth, or feminist patriarchy-based programmes, and also the indicated that CBT, or cognitive behaviour therapy, therapy modalities, are no better. Reference 68. In the UK in 2006-07, the programme DVIP, Domestic Violence Intervention Project, had 230 referrals, but only 33 men completed the course, i.e. a completion rate of a woeful 14%, reference 69. Moreover, taking into account its limited effectiveness, even for men who, who completed the programme, as DVIP admitted before a Home Office Select Committee in 2008, reference 70, DVIP can be concluded to have been affected in 23 cases out of 230, i.e. 10%. In the absence of a control group, this might even be consistent with zero effectiveness. It's worth noting that one of the originators of the Duluth model, Ellen Pence herself, was ultimately to reject the model herself, based on hard practical experience. The following extracts are taken from reference 71, 1999, of which Ellen Pence was a co-author. He does it for the power, he does it for the control, he does it because he can. These were the jingles that, in our opinion, said all there was to say. But on the next page she clarifies how wrong they were.
By determining that the need or desire for power was the motivating force behind battering, we created a conceptual framework that, in fact, did not fit the lived experience of many of the men and women we were working with. Like those we were criticising, we reduced our analysis to a psychological universal truism. The domestic abuse interventional programme staff, like the therapist insisting it was an anger control problem, or the judge wanting to see it as an alcohol problem, or the defence attorney arguing it was a defective wife problem, remained undaunted by the differences in our theory and the actual experiences of those we were working with. We all engaged in ideological practices and claimed them to be neutral observations. I found that many of the men I interviewed did not seem to articulate a desire for power over a partner. Although I relentlessly took every opportunity to point out to the men in groups that they were so motivated and merely in denial, the fact that few men ever articulated such a desire went unnoticed by me and many of my co-workers. Eventually, we realised that we were finding what we had predetermined to find. End quote. In the face of all these negative observations, it is remarkable that the ideological stranglehold of Duluth on perpetrator programmes is still firmly in place in the UK and elsewhere. This means that perpetrator programmes that could work for either sex have been pushed to the margins and all but eliminated. 